Hello, hello, hello. It's time. Yay. 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 Energy, yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael, and I'll be your event host tonight, and welcome to Greenlight. We're excited to host tonight's event with Elizabeth Crane presenting her new book, This Story Will Change. She'll be talking to Leslie Jamison, so you're in for an excellent night. Before I turn things over to them, just a couple housekeeping things. Turn off for silent cell phones. Masks are to be worn the whole event. Sign books are for sale at the register, and um, Elizabeth has agreed to be personalizing afterwards. Um, and the recording will be available on YouTube if all goes well. And we close at 9. So the event will be over. The talk will be 8.30 we'll, is when it'll end. Personalize, and then the store overall will close at 9. Our interviewer for the evening is Leslie Jamison. Leslie is the New York Times best-selling author of two essay collections, The Empathy Exams and Make It Scream, Make It Burn, as well as the critical memoir, The Recovering, and a novel, The Jan Closet. She is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and teaches at Columbia University. She lives in Brooklyn with her daughter. She will be speaking with our featured author, Elizabeth Crane. Elizabeth is the author of six works of fiction, most recently the novel, The History of Great Things, and the story collection, Turk, which is also behind there and signed. She teaches in the low residency master's program at UC Riverside, Palm Desert, and lives in upstate New York. Her new book, This Story Will Change, is an intimate and evolving portrait about the end of a marriage and how life can fall apart and be rebuilt in a wonderful and surprising way. Crafting the story as the events she chronicles are unfolding, Crane writes from a place of guarded possibility, capturing through vignettes and collected moments of semblance of the real-time practice of healing. At times funny, at turns funny and dark, this story will change. is an unexpected and moving portrait of a woman in transformation and a chronicle of how even the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves are bound to change. Oof. Hold on, let me read that again. <laughs> a chronicle of how even the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves are bound to change. So, you're in for something special tonight. Elizabeth will be reading from her book, then Leslie will join her in conversation, and you'll have a chance to ask your questions after that. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth and Leslie. Let's face it, love isn't always enough. And maybe 
maybe more than one person who died had extensive notes on why they thought this marriage was doomed, but held their peace because they knew what, that people did what they wanted, but then everyone died, always having held their peace, leaving the couple to never know what they really thought, and or, moreover, maybe possibly in some universe, changing the course of the couple's history. You know, if they'd listened, and they were like, you're right, love isn't enough, and they walked away and had lives that were better in ways they couldn't have imagined then, since everything seemed so great at the time, but instead, they went ahead and got married because they didn't know there were all these unspoken predictors of doom. <laughs> if everyone, I'm, I'm, I guess I don't believe in periods. If everyone was their peace, and then they died with all their pieces, how would the couple ever know? We were there. We doubt either of them would have listened. All right. And then we'll one little thing. Um, way back. It's all kind of jumps around. There's nothing to be. I don't, but I do. <clears throat> I don't want to regret having married him, but sometimes I do. I don't want to erase the last 15 years, but I don't want to remember them now either. I don't want to remember the things I thought were good and wonder if they weren't so good. I don't want to mention his name in casual conversation, but if I don't, then I have to heavily revise 15 years worth of stories. I have to make we into I, and I think we all know how to make we. I don't want to hate someone I loved, but sometimes I do. I don't want to put my trust in someone new, but I don't want to not trust someone new because one specific person broke my trust. I don't want to wonder if my marriage was good, but now I do. I don't want to wonder if I was a terrible wife, but now I do. I don't want to wonder who my husband is, but now I, but I do. I don't want to wonder if I never knew who my husband was, if he never knew me. I don't want to look at his Instagram photos, but sometimes I do. I don't want to construe stories about what photos of art or windows or inanimate objects mean in terms of our relationship, past, and present, or future, but sometimes I do. I don't want to be married to someone who doesn't want to be married to me, but I don't want to get divorced. I don't want to be single. Remember how single I once was? I don't want to go on fucking Tinder dates. Someone kill me before I do, because it will kill me, and I don't want my obituary to say her husband left her and she was killed by Tinder. She couldn't open a Tinder and swiped and swiped whichever way means no until she died. I know the great couple who met on Tinder. There are no more great Tinder couples. I don't want to date at all. I don't want to show someone my 57-year-old body, and I don't want to get used to some new dude's weird body. I got used to one dude's weird body. Dude's bodies are just weird. <laughs> I don't want this to be a story about losing one dude and then meeting a new dude and then everything is better. I don't want this to be a story about losing a dude and then finding myself and then everything is better. I want a story without losing and without finding. I want this to be a story about everything just being better. I was going to say I could listen to you read from this book all night, as you know. Um, I love this book so much. I, I know that some people here have already read it and already love it, but if for some reason you have not already read it, like remedy that immediately because it's so good. And it, you know, I am also working on a, a version of a divorce memoir right now. And this book did so much for me as a human being. It made me think about love in new ways, and marriage in new ways, and divorce in new ways, and writing in new ways, and writing about love and marriage and divorce in new ways. And it, it, it just rearranged my molecules and made me feel that sense of like, there is a way of looking at the world that is full of love and honesty and, and hard, tough insights and humor, and we could hear all that, and it just that, that way that when you can experience somebody's gaze of the world and it opens up the world in those ways, it's just, it's the best kind of gift, um, and this book is that gift. So um, I'm just I'm so thrilled to be talking about it with you tonight and just helping to celebrate it. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm such a craft nerd, and I know you are too. And this book is so beautifully crafted. Like as we could hear just in those two sections that you read, like the form of the book is these very um, short 
short-ish, but some of them very short, um, titled sections. They have incredible titles, like um, <laughs> Forever, and I Do and I Don't, and They Got a King Size Bed, and They Got an L-Shaped Sofa. And um, I just wanted to ask you about how you came to this form, which feels so perfect that, as a reader, it feels inevitable. How could this book exist any other way? But how did you get to these fragments and their way of telling the truth? Uh, well, uh, okay, that's a really good question. Um, I, like, I guess I'll just say, like, I, I didn't want to write this. I didn't want to write this. I was, it was, a lot of it was written while it was happening. I, I wanted to write something else because writing makes me feel good. And, um, but I couldn't think about anything else because I was sad and obsessed with figuring out what went wrong because I really didn't, I just didn't know. I, I didn't know what happened. So it was a lot about me just scribbling down questions. Like, was it this? I mean, there's stuff in the, it's, some of it's still in here. Like, was it this? Was it this? Was it because was it we got a king size bed? Was it because we got too big of a sofa? Like, what? You know, I just, um, I, so I, I think, first of all, I think a lot in questions. So that's, there are an awful lot of questions in the craft of it. Um, but I also, it is, it does, e even though there are kind of like weird stylistic choices, a lot of it is just how I, it ha it's how it comes in, like, it's how I think. Like, you know, it's like, is there some math that I could do here? And so then we'll, we'll try a math equation, like this and this and this adds up to why my marriage failed. Or this and this and this adds up to why he was interested in someone else. Or, you know, um, or maybe I'll make a list here because if I figure out, you know, these things that went wrong or, um, you know, things that would have things that would have been better, but things that would have been better, like, Okay, I'll try a list, you know. Um, and I did, I rejected a lot of little forms, too, that I was sort of thinking about playing with. Um, but I don't know if that answers the question, but it, 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 it even, even though it's, like, I understand that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of playful in a way, right? But it, it is, and my, because it doesn't feel playful in my brain necessarily, but it is, it is sort of like, okay, I'm going to throw this down and see what works, and, you know, you throw out a lot, too. Well, and I think there's a, um, there's also an intimacy in it, in that, because it does feel like it's representing what you're describing, this process of genuinely trying to figure something out, like, what happened here, you know, and I think um, anybody who's been through with the end of a relationship, anybody who's like been alive for a day, I don't know, <laughs> has, has, has been humbled, I think, by that sense of what happened here, whether you're the, the, the one who ends a relationship or not, I think that those pose kind of different unanswerable mysteries, but in a way, it's like if you were to try to tell the story another way that had more firmly decided on the reasons, it would A, I think, feel false or limiting, and B, yes. it would make us feel further from you, like we're not with you in that process. I think also, you know, it is very true to how I write fiction. I, I play in my fiction too, and I, um, and I, I, I honestly, I thought I was gonna trash this. I was just like, I'm just gonna write this because I can't think about anything else, and so I wrote it. Um, but I, I, in the course of writing it, I sort of felt like there was a, a germ of something happening, so I started to get a little more conscious about what I was putting down and choices that I was making. Um, but it is very much in keeping with my fictional style, which I didn't kind of understand that I could do in nonfiction. I don't, I, I don't know why I had some really limited ideas about, but it's one of the reasons why I haven't um, put any of my nonfiction out in the world previously, because it didn't feel like me. I was taking all the fun out of it. So. Right, when you said earlier like there's something playful about it, I think it does feel like a playful book, but it feels like that way that, that kind of playfulness that's also a way of surviving, and also a way of, of just 100, sitting with. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very much.
<laughs> it's so funny because were as you were as I was listening to you read, I kept like every other line that you spoke, I kept being like, oh maybe that should have been the title of the book, even though I love the title of the book, where I'm like, dude's bodies are just weird. Like I would read a book called that by you in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, so I, I was thinking as I was reading this, one of the things I love is how um is how tenderly and specifically and truthfully you write the love in your marriage. And I was thinking about something that I might be misparaphrasing her, but something that our friend Mary Carr says about, or has said about writing divorce, which is that you don't write the heartbreak of divorce by writing the pain of it, but by writing the love that came before. And that's where the heartbreak is. And we get to marry to say such a thing, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, she also, I was reading her book of, her craft book recently, and I texted her, because I, because there was, like, she had these rules, and one was like, don't write about your divorce while you're going through it, and I was like, oh shit, Mary, sorry. <laughs> like, I think you're fine. Um, but, yeah, that's, um, that was so important to me, because I, did love him, and that's part of why I was so confused. But I, I didn't want to write a book about my husband being a terrible person who I mean, hurt me. I mean, he did hurt me, but because I, I stayed married to him for 15 years, I thought he was a really good person. I still think he's a good person, you know. So I, I wanted that to be really clear, and I, and I also, you know, it kind of is in keeping with. Uh, you know, I think this is true both in real life, it's real life and in writing. Um, accountability is something that matters to me, you know. I don't, um, you know, I know the choice that he made that did hurt me that started this whole thing, but I also, it's really important for me to kind of look deeper than that. I don't think a marriage just falls apart because one person decides that it's not going, if one person isn't happy, something's going wrong. You know, and I felt like it was really important for me to look at my own side of that street, too. You know. Yeah, and there's so much. I mean, there's so there's such a your gaze is so attuned to those the kinds of small domestic moments that hold. It's not like you're putting forward any single one of those moments, the L-shaped couch or the king-size bed or the trips that were taken or the trips that weren't taken or the questions that were asked, the questions that weren't asked. Like it's, You're not holding any single thing as the cause, but you are paying really close attention to like those kinds of moments that do you feel like they hold just a dynamic between two people? Like, well, why do you, why, why is the fitted sheet always coming up? Well, I'm trying to check it in better. We'll try a little harder. Well, I'm really trying. You know, like, those moments, that's, that's a big part of what marriage is. And you, you, this book pays attention to that yeah. in this amazing way. But that's so interesting to hear you say because, you know, I've only been inside of one marriage. And I, and, and even if I had been inside of two, you know, I would still only know about those two because from, you know, I have no idea what anyone else's marriage was like. And that's also a question that I kind of was asking myself and, and have asked myself since I decided to get married. It's like, what, is, what does this even mean? Like, I always knew that I could do it in a way that I felt comfortable. It was 2004 and it's 2022 now. We can do these things in our own, you know, um, way. But it's still... But it did kind of, I don't even think I got into this as much as I would have probably liked in a book, but I, you know, to gender roles and things within marriage, you know? And the way that also, like, like um, tensions or conflicts or, or, or even intimacy and connection are always playing out, or not always, but often playing out on these very small theaters, right? And sometimes as a writer, I guess, I should just say for myself, I feel like I shy away from the actual theaters where experience happens, because I think, well, nobody wants to read about that fight about was he flirting with a girl at the party or not? But it's like, actually, that's where so much experience happens, is those, right. those moments, you know? Right, right. And it, you know, it's, it's um, and I think too, like you, you know, sometimes like, I wouldn't be writing about all these moments that I'm looking at. Like they, they, 
you know, they may or may not have contributed or been part of it, but I think the fact that they were in my mind to, to write about, mm -hmm. like, could it be this, was, like, was, you know, you have these things and you don't want to know that maybe things aren't so good, and so you sort of, you're like, oh, it's, it's fine, it's no good deal, you know? Um, and then you start to think, I maybe should have spoken up about that, or, you know, um, or he should have spoken about whatever it is, you know? But it was very subtle in the marriage. You know, it was so, it was so like, was, there was nothing dramatic about my marriage, which was why there were so many questions. <laughs> well, and there's something, and I think that gets back to that, that again, what you, what, you, what you do so beautifully in evoking what also was um, so obviously a deep love as well, and a deep care for each other. And I wonder, just on a craft level, almost selfishly as a writer, I wonder how, when you think about, okay, I want to I wanna also portray this love, this deep love, how we cared for each other, what we gave to each other, how do you, how did you, how did you think about what moments, sometimes it's so hard when somebody asks you about your partner, like, what do you love about them? And suddenly you're like, oh, I don't know, he's nice and funny, you know what I mean? It's like, not you, me, I'm like, yeah, like, you know, but it's like, it's so hard actually to find, I think love and happiness and intimacy with a partner are, some of the hardest things to actually capture in interesting ways. So I wonder how you thought about what memories are going to do this work, or what details about him or about us together are going to do this work. Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't know. Again, which is why I kind of catalog things, right? So there's like a, a list of gifts, you know? Like, he made this for me, he made this, he made this, he, you know, he did, all, he did all these nice things for me, and, you know, um, like, that, that was a way of... You know, because I, I mean, his his personality was sort of like he's a quiet person. He's kind of a quiet person, and that's kind of hard to convey, like why that person is lovable in, in a certain way. But um, you know, it it so I really was kind of like, well, how can I show him as a full fully realized person and not just the person who hurt me? But it did. I mean, again, like I spent a lot of time sort of thinking about what are those. Um, what are those things that somebody else might see and say? You know, like, I understand why she stayed in the marriage and why the, the marriage ended as well. Yeah, and it's and it's it's interesting because I think as you were talking about sort of imagining how the person reading the book might be receiving, you know, different memories or, or sort of both sides of the story. I was thinking about how you often invoke the you of the reader in these pages, which is also so, you know, I wish I could, I wish I could show you the patina on the bathroom that he finished for me, or I wish I could, I, I, you could probably imagine the way I was not smiling when he said, I think we might be in different life phases right now. It was a hard not smiling, but you're sort of imagining that the you. I love when people remember my words better than I remember. <laughs> well, there are so many great words in here, so many words that, um, lodged in me in the best possible way but I wonder how you thought about whether that whether how you thought about a kind of relationship forming between you and these potential readers of your book out there or how that you kept showing up you know I think my I think that my hope was just that I mean I'm, you know I, I, truly I I just I need to come back to like I really didn't think anyone was going to read it at first you know I I just um, I, because I was so depressed, and I thought, like, well, I'm depressed, this is surely depressing, and, um, like, even if it was a little bit funny, um, and so I, I wasn't, init until we got, you know, I started sharing a little bit, and people would start to read it privately or whatever, you know, and, and, and then ultimately started, it was more kind of when I got around to really, fine-tuning and shaping it and edit, editing it, you know, that I started to think about, like, what I, because I, because let's put it this way, I was, like, not censoring myself when I was originally, you know, writing this, and um, not thinking about anybody reading it, um, and then when I realized, like, oh, I wrote this about a person I love, like, there are things I'm not going to include, there's just things I'm not going to include. And so I had to think about, okay, what do I keep that um, gives you as much of a 
picture as you can get, um, and also being as honest as I can be about my experience of it. Uh, but also, I didn't want to put anything egregious in to just like because I was pissy about something that was just going to be me, me bitching, basically. You know? I mean, it's probably really good. I'm like, now, like, is there, can, can one get one pans on a kind of director's cut version of the You set? can. <laughs> you absolutely can. I will send you something later. Yeah, there were many things. Like, there were some things that were actually really good that I cut. I was just like, and I don't think I can put this into the world. Yeah. But I also, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, and actually, not, not kind. Not kind. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm so in the thick of some of those questions right now. But um, yeah, I mean, and that's actually connected to another thing I really was curious to ask you about. And I have like a million questions, but I also know, um, I bet the people here have some questions. So we'll turn over in a few minutes. But um, I was going to ask about, yeah, I don't know where we are. It's uh, five to eight, so okay. we're good. We're good. Um, I was going to ask about the process of editing and revising, both in terms of like how did this book change from earliest iterations to like what we're holding, which you've started to speak to, but kind of whether there were things that you, parts of the story that you only got to by hitting that second draft or that third draft. Yeah, well, you know, when you when you start to have something that even looks like a first draft, you you know, um, I mean, I have, you know, I have a best friend who's also a writer. She always reads for me, and she's my cheerleader, and, you know, so she always makes me feel good. And then I have some other friends that I was, I did a reading early on that was, you know, I, was, oh, I can't believe these people are responding to this. That's bananas. Because that really was, like, that was before I sold it. I was just like, let me see how this plays. Um, but... It was helpful to see, to hear what people were responding to. Um, but I, you know, I, there was so much, so much left out. Not even just stuff that was questionable, but just like, this is not as strong. I don't have to have this, you know? And, and then of course, like as the editing process goes on, I mean, shout out to Dan Smetanka because he is good and he is hands on and, um, you know, uh, everything from line edits to, like, notes. And in fact, there was, you know, there was a whole thing. And he also asked me so much about what is the story here that you want to tell. I was like, the story is the title. You know, the story is so much about the title to me because I, I knew that I didn't know what the story was when I sat down to write it. Really, not really, you know. And furthermore, that by the time I finished writing it, that many things would have changed, which is totally true, you know? Um, and so Dan, this was like in maybe even like January or February of this year, were we editing that late? I can't even remember, but he, he was asking me like, what do you want, you know, what, what are we getting? So we teased out a few more things, like we sort of played up like the title, we put a few more little bits about the title, throughout, which we didn't originally have, because we really wanted to hammer home that kind of like, you think, you know, it's this, but then you're going to find this other thing out, like that changes, for me, changes the story a lot. I mean, I don't want it's not like a mystery or anything that I won't be giving away, but there's this, there's this impression that I had about something that my husband had said to me very early in our relationship that was, that I held on to for all these years. And it was, it just wasn't true. I went in my journal and I read and it was not true. It was not true. And so to kind of acknowledge that, like, I was the one that concocted that thing, um, sort of proved my point that the story would change, which I already made the title. But, um, but in any case, you know, he, one of the themes is, is a theme of motherhood. Like, I don't have kids, but there's this kid that comes into my life sort of right after I uh, move, I, I fled to the city for a year because I was very sad and I needed to get away from my small town. And um, I had a roommate, friend, old friend of mine, and his like, teenage daughter was basically living with us during that time. And I was just like, I was like a, an extra mom to her, 
you know, she was she was having, going through stuff, and I was madly in love with her, and still am, and uh, and and so a lot of stuff about my idea of whether or not I would have been a good mother mm -hmm. is sort of threaded through the book, mm -hmm. and so that came up in in this conversation with Dan, and 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 that thing where I refer back to finding out this. Thing that wasn't true about my husband. He was like, "That's not. I, that's not there." He was like, "What?" I was like, "What are you talking?" I was like, "It's in this chapter." I pointed out. He was like, "Just one sentence." So he made me write a chapter, like a new. It's one of the longer. It's like, like a three-page <laughs> chapter, and he made me write that, like very thing else, and read it for me. Like, like I'm doing this is like last so last minute, and it was so like it was actually kind of more serious or like it felt more heavy to me and I was like does this match tonally but he you know but I think it's like I see now like how important that is to the to have uh, expanded on that idea um, and that was really late in the game you know yeah well it objects yeah, so much to say I mean I'm so I was I was curious to hear about some of the ways that people ask questions or what what readers gave you that brought you to new places with the book. But I that particular part of the book where you're revisiting memory and realizing that you've been sort of telling yourself a particular story about something that happened that wasn't how it happened, is it I feel like that's a part of the book that readers can take with them in so many different directions. You know, like when you were saying earlier like you've only been in your marriage, not in anybody else's marriage, I think one of the real gifts of the book is like it's not pretending to make universalizing claims about anything. It's making it's making very specific observations about a particular life, and that's always what resonates to me. It's specificity that's not forcing its resonance on that's you. How I it's feel. Like, that's yeah, how I feel. You when take what you too. take from yes. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But everybody has those moments where you're humbled by the ways that memory has distorted something. You so you know so I, humbling, and you know this was a thing that he had apologized for like many times, and it turns out he didn't even say it. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's, and it's you know it's 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 um again it's like part of the gift of the book is the way that it doesn't it doesn't try to get rid of all the raggedness of figuring things out or self-correcting it lets so much of it stand. So there's another version of the book that just, I guess, wouldn't have put in the thing that never happened. But of course, your your memory of it becomes then a part of the relationship and a part of your experience of the world. And you know, I know it's so weird. <laughs> it's like the story changes. The story will change in so many directions, right, where it's like the story will change in terms of like the life you thought you were going to live turns out a different way, but the story will change even in the life you already have lived is different maybe than what you thought. Yes, no, and I, and I think that, like, and I do think like on the kind of bigger level, what I certainly hope that, you know, in kind of applying it to your own, it's not something you're going to need to study, but like in applying it to your own experience, like to you know, sort of understand that, you know, I only have these eyes, I only have this very, very faulty memory, you know, um, and uh, I have no idea, no, no idea, but, you know, how he experienced me to a certain extent, you know, I know he loved me, and he was very expressive about that, but what I mean is, like, the, in the things that we didn't talk about, you know, um, his story would be totally different. He's not a writer, but it would be totally different. And probably someone looking from the outside, if they were just imagining our marriage, it would also be different. There's a, I don't know if you know the writer Barbara Browning, but she, um, in her novel Gift, she has this incredible moment where she imagines a version of one of her autobiographical texts that, in which she has sent it to everybody else who shows up in the text. Their responses are in the margins, like comments in the margins, and the version that goes out into the world is essentially her narrative 
with everybody else's comments appended to it, which is oh. totally terrifying. It's like an anxiety dream. Oh, wow. Writ large or something, but it's also pretty, like, I would I would read that in a heartbeat, you know, that kind yeah. of, because it's what, it, that's yeah. like, that's the kind of, yeah. In a, it's not necessarily the truest version of the story, but it's like a, but it's an area. a lot of the memoir that I like asks a lot of questions about memory, you know, and, or, or different points of view, or different points of view, you know. And I'm glad you brought up, um, maybe, well, I, I will turn it over soon, um, because I don't want to monopolize <laughs> your mind when you have so many people who love you so much in the room. Um, but I'm glad you brought up your year in the city and this apartment with your buddy and the daughter you're madly in love with. Yeah. And um, because it, this, I mean, this book is about the end of a marriage and, and the ways in which life is sort of collapsed or restructured around that. But it is also really about um, finding new definitions of like what love can be, what family can be. Yes. And, and I'd love to just hear you talk about that part of the book, writing that year of this kind of strange, beautiful, cobbled together family. What was um, freeing and exciting about writing that fa that family life? What was hard about doing justice to it? Just what, what, what that part of the story means to you. You know, I don't think there would be a story if I weren't, if not for that. I feel like that whole period of time is what, is, is actually where I found the story, you know? And it's like, there were, like, there were so many, um, you know, when, like, because it was a nice, it was a real, it was one of my oldest friends, we were friends for 30 years, um, and um, it was very comfortable and easy, and uh, he's very funny, He's really, really funny, so we've laughed a lot. And, I mean, I was laughing and crying a lot through my first year. And um, I think that, like, I just think otherwise it would be like, what is, you know, it's not, it didn't, um, I, I wasn't uh, fixed by it. I wasn't fixed by it, but it was a, uh, it was a circumstance that was um, that did kind of open my eyes to like these definitions of relationships or things that we think have to be. We were, you know, we were platonic friends, but we were very close, and and there was this kid there, and it was just like I mean, it, it was like a sitcom. I talk about it in the book. It was like kind of like a sitcom with like teenagers coming and going and busting in the door and you know, bringing their laundry, and, and, um, and I loved every second of it, you know, and, um, and so I, I just feel like that kind of, like, to know that I could have joy in an awful time, you know, was, was the thing that, and, and it did, all this motherhood stuff kind of really kind of came back to, Play, so it, it kind of played into that too, but I feel like if there was no kind of joy at all, <laughs> I don't know what, like, I just feel like the story, you know, it would have been short and very sad. <laughs> or I would have put it aside and waited until I got some other kind of joy, you know? Well, and, the, and that particular, the joy of the kind of um, bustling house and there's a you know there's a big bed in that in that That's apartment so like this it becomes almost like a character in the story too because <laughs> all these talks happen on the big bed yeah. and and there are these ways that like that bustling apartment in the city and the kind of unexpected forms of joy and family it does provide these counterpoints too to the you know the house that is full of the past and the residue right. of this, yes. and, and even the, you know the, the king size bed was the king size bed. Then the marriage, but then the big bed shows up, and it's a kind of it's a it's a super it's super that oh, it's a see, big bed. I didn't you even know? think of that, Leslie. But, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I meant for that to come on totally. <laughs> Which is those ways that sort of when you pay attention to the I I really believe that when you pay attention to the kind of particulars of experience and the things that are looming large or somehow have a kind of heat in your own mind, you don't actually have to be super intentional or top down about all of those 
yes. lines of connection as they start emerging. I think you're abs I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to open it up, although I have like a thousand more. Um, but, um, you know, I am so interested in surprise as a part of being alive, when and how are we surprised. So much grace, I think, lives, I mean, I've had some bad surprises too, but a lot of grace can live in surprise, I think, and just that, the, that in the way this Surprise is a manifestation, like the story will change, like you don't know what the story is, you know, that's part yes. of what surprise is. Yeah. And um, I just would be curious to hear you talk a little bit about what surprised you in the process of writing this book. I mean, I guess that it became a book at all, is one thing from what you're saying. Very but, much. But what, Very much. what kind of, what surprised you in terms of what emerged or what um, moments or truths or thoughts or memories that the book ended up taking you to that you hadn't expected? Yeah, you know, oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I do think I do think we kind of touched on most of it. I think, you know, everything about what happened when I went to the city was a total surprise. Because my friend lent me his apartment. It's this spectacular <laughs> East Village apartment um, that he doesn't really live in, and I didn't have a plan. I went with a suitcase. And you know, I have friends here, so I was just like, I'm gonna go be with my friends because I don't know what else to do. Um, and and my friend coming back to the city at that time was completely random coincidence. He was living in LA at the time, and so he just moved back to the city, and um, you know, he was gonna sleep in the guest room for like a couple of days while he was gonna get an Airbnb and whatever. And then we were like having like we had fun and. Then one week was two weeks, and two weeks was a month, and then a month later he was like, no, we're always living here. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, uh, it surprised both of us. You know, we still talk about it all the time. It's just like, that was a magical time, it, as sad as it was. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that... And also just that like I was able to show up for, I had a lot of good things going on in my life that year too. And I thought that I was not gonna show up for some of those things because I was so sad. I just thought I would like cry through everything I did, which I did kind of, but I also <laughs> laughed and was really happy to be able to have these experiences and not miss out on them just because you know, so it was it was kind of surprising to me that I was able to do that, and a lot of that was because of that friend, but also a lot of other friends too. Yeah, 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 yeah. The kind of surprise of simultaneity and how something can can hurt, and also yeah. the world can be a lot of other things, and relationships can be a lot of other things at once. That very yeah. much, yeah. Um, what questions do you all have? Um, you talk about a journal, but are you, and you also, I think you said this is your first book, is this your first memoir? First memoir, yeah. So, when you're, fiction. When you're, fiction. Fiction. So when you're writing this book, was there like, I'm journaling and then I'm writing a memoir, or did you use the journal to feed the memoir, or like how did that... So you know, I didn't actually go, that's an interesting question, I didn't even go into the journals, into, I mean, I keep, I keep a daily journal. Um, and if anybody ever read my journals, that would be, like, I sort of have a plan to burn them, like, <laughs> before I die someday, like, have a big bonfire. Um, because it's, like, up until, like, up until I was 40, it was just a lot of kind of boys. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I don't, I, there's nothing crafted about it. But it, but I do like to really record things that happened you know, maybe the day before, or if I, you know, sometimes it's mundane, sometimes it's super boring, but I, but if I've had a really exciting day, you know, the next morning I'll try to record some of the conversation. Because actually, um, my friend who, who, my buddy in the book, was saying, like, you got those conversations between us, like, like, they're like, verbatim. <laughs> it's like, were you recording that? I was like, I did write a lot of them down like the next day because they were really funny and great, you know? So, 
That's, and that's why, so, but when I was trying to remember things that I couldn't remember, that's when I went back and reread my journals, my journal journals, which I don't recommend for any other reason than if you're a writer, because it's just wretched, a wretched thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Matt. Hi, Erin. I guess, uh, I guess, I was, I have a statement in my question. Okay. Um, I, uh, we met while, while you were really sad about your divorce. I was still sad. Um, I remember hearing a lot about you being sad. And it's so remarkable to me that this is the book that came out of so much grief. And, um, just because it's so, it's so, um, it's so funny, but also it's just, you're so generous um, in how you write about something that caused you so much pain. Hmm. Um, how, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this, I, part of, a, a huge part of writing for me is to entertain myself. So there's a little bit of a combination, I mean in this case it was a lot of trying to piece things together and, and see what the story of my marriage was, but I do like to amuse myself when I'm writing. And, um, you know, I hope that other people will be amused. But the other part of that, too, is that I, I also try to, I want to be as truthful as I can in my writing. I, and I don't think it's, it doesn't feel generous necessarily. It just feels like, but it does feel like I would be cheating you if I didn't try my best. But this is the thing, you know, I... I kept asking people that were reading it for me as, as I was going along, like, I kept saying, like, what am I, am I asking the right questions? Like, am I, miss, am I go, going deep enough? Like, because I, maybe I thought, like, I think what I thought was going to happen was that somebody was going to tell me what went wrong in my marriage, like, <laughs> definitively. And, you know, you missed this one, this is so obvious, you missed this big thing here, you know? Um, and nobody did, but I, didn't think, I still thought that maybe they were just pulling out of me or something like that. So I did all, I, you know, that was work that I was trying to do, was just like push myself to really uncover whatever, whatever the truth was, even though I didn't know for sure what it was when I started. Does that answer the question? Oh, I see a hand. Hi. My question is about what you learned in writing this book about how removed you have to be from an emotionally profound experience in order to mm -hmm. write about it in a way where you are able to excavate enough to fully show the person and the experience, but not so removed that you forget yeah. the personality of it. You know, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I don't know what you would say about this, Leslie, because I think it's different for different people. And I certainly talk to my students about this, too. Like. You know, it really depends on the, the experiences, it depends on you. Like, for me, like, writing is how I understand the world, you know? And so, I, like, I'm not going to be more sad writing. I mean, I did kind of take breaks sometimes, so like, because I, I, like, sometimes I write, like, a, I'd have a seven page day or something. And I'm like, Oh, what did I do that for? This is too, you know, I need to go check out with some TV or something right now. But, um, you know, especially if you're talking about something traumatic, you know, like, you might be a person who could write while you're closer to it. But I think you have to be really thoughtful about that on a really individual um, level, you know. I mean, for me, I'm just kind of like, I'm very in touch with my feelings, <laughs> and so I'm okay with, you know, I know I'm kind of going to be okay, I guess. I didn't think I was, I really didn't think I was going to be okay, but I knew that writing wasn't going to make it worse. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, 
it's a it's a great question, and I, yeah, and I I mean I resonate with a lot of what you just said and what you've been saying sort of throughout the night about there being different uh, different stages of writing about an experience. So what I definitely don't agree with or wouldn't know how to make happen in my life as a writer is somehow the idea that the more distance you have from an experience, the better you can write about it. Like, I feel like there's a way of talking about, or I guess it usually comes across as a critique of writing too close to an experience, like, or a critique of people who write about their personal experience when they're too young and they don't have the perspective on it. And, and to me, it's, it's not that I think, I think you absolutely can write about an experience when you're still too close to it, but I actually think it's much more complicated than just like somehow the natural extension of that line of thinking that like, which nobody ever says it like this because then it would expose something I think kind of untenable about it, but like the idea that you just gain more and more perspective as you move further in your life, so like the ideal would be like all of us writing everything in like the instant before we die. Or but don't, I, don't, but I think it's like, more like the perspective may change, but it doesn't mean that the perspective is more correct. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> right? Like, and I actually, and maybe I'm the only person who would be down for this, but there are so many experiences where I would love to read somebody's what some how somebody would write a given experience like the day after, like. Right. five months after, a right. year after, right. five years after, 25 right. years right. after, because they would all be different, and they'd all be different versions of the truth, and rather than it feeling like, oh, I'd rather somebody just get to the most truthful one and be done with it, I'm like, no, I'm just interested in the way that perspective changed, because I yeah. think you have immediacy on the one hand, and that gives certain kinds of truth, and then you have time on the other yeah. hand, which has different kinds of truth to give, yeah. but I definitely think what you're saying about process, like, Emotionally, right. I know for me, like emotionally, ooh, I'm more like I when I write it close, like you know, I re I certainly remember feelings I had long ago, and I think I I think I'm capable of writing about my childhood with a perspective, you know, of distance, but. But as an adult, I've written through a lot of the more challenging things, you know, my lost my mom, and you know, I wrote like, <laughs> but again, I thought like as I was writing it, I wrote this like the saddest stories like six months after my mom died, and it was like about the first year of her death, and I was just like, oh, this is awful, and then I had someone read it, she's like, no, you have to save this story, so I kept working on it, but you know, I, I just do it because it's what I do, and I don't know that that's going to work for everyone, but. And how does that, well, I, I won't co-op for too long, but I'm curious how that plays differently for you in fiction and non-fiction. Like, do you feel like sometimes it's, you're writing fiction that is really in response to something quite immediate in your life, but it feels like you often, can write about it in, in a fictional form? Like, yes, a like, yes, like I, I wrote a short story you know, like very immediately, at, like I was triggered by uh, the Trump um, Access Hollywood tape when that came on. I was like standing in front of my TV shaking and I didn't know why I was having this like physical response. And then I started thinking like, I'm 60 years old. It, this was like five years ago or whatever. And I hadn't ever thought about like, you know, how that kind of attitude had actually affected me and, and many, many ways I sort of started writing about like a lifetime of harassment and just like spilled out. <laughs> you know, like so there's distance, but it was also like this very immediate thing that made me feel physically ill and unwell, you know. Um, so I, I do t I do tend to like yeah, just try to get it done and hope for the best. <laughs> This also, yeah. There's like a there. If you give if you give a first draft or a diary entry or whatever, all of that immediacy, then you know that you can sort of trust the other selves that will be coming into play in the editorial process that can take take the grit and specifics of that immediacy and also bring. Yes, you know, like once it's down, and then and then the craft, then you go in and like. Tighten it and noodle with it and change and to butt and to to fro and whatever it is, you know, and then back again. Any, yeah, any last, it seems like we have time for one or two more questions. Or not. <laughs>
personal question. They might be too personal. Oh, that's okay, Rebecca. That's so if it is too personal, you can tell me a different time. I will, I will. <laughs> 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 like, you don't have to answer. Like, you don't tell me that. <laughs> I still want to know. Yeah. Um, but my question is about the editing in terms of him reading it. Oh, yeah. And like how that was for you. But secondly, did it help with the healing process or at all? Like, it's a it good question. Did it reopen the communication between the two of you, et cetera, you know? Well, you know, the communication has always been kind, somewhat open. I mean, the first year was rough. The rest of the time has been, it's, we've had a, an ongoing communication. Um, but but I, it was very important to me that he read it. Um, I don't know that I would have changed it if he had wanted me to, you know. Um, but I, but it was, I didn't, I didn't want to hurt him with it, you know. Um, I do remember kind of, like when we were, even when we were just in couples therapy and we're, like we're standing right outside the bathroom or something and I was like, you know I'm going to write about this. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, I know. Um, and he actually, you know, speaking of those things that I didn't include, he told me that I could include some of them. I was like, it's, it's egregious. Like it's not, you know, it doesn't serve the story really in any way. So I, I am very, very, very grateful to his patience. I don't think it's been easy for him, you know, but he was very kind and cool about it. And I feel very lucky. I don't think that's always the case. I have a slight follow-up, and then, <laughs> but it, which it comes with the same caveat <laughs> <laughs> here, but but do you, do you do you think do you think there are things that he understands differently or better or more deeply by virtue of having read the book than I don't. We did not. We yeah no. I don't. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I mean, we we have had many 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 com like long conversations that I'm always the one that starts. I'm sorry, um, but I they're not really relative to the book. They're more just about us, you know. I think. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Like the conversation was minimal. You know, he was very he was very kind about it. I and that was pretty much. I don't think, it, and it definitely wasn't easy for him to read, you know, but he was very kind about it, but I think it was probably a lot for him to, I can't, I keep trying to imagine if someone wrote a book about me, you know, like my best friend and I have included each other as characters in things, as fictional characters of things, and we're cool with that and we talk about it, um, but, you know, we're like the best friend character, so it's not like, you know, um, it's, I cannot, I keep trying to imagine, like, what? I just can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. So. There was one in the front and then one there. I think it was that. Okay, one, well, yeah, sure. One last one. I thought, oh, no, no. Oh, I thought, oh, did you? Oh, I did, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a question on the scope, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading it, but just from hearing you talk about it, it sounds like it sort of moves around across those 15 years. Very so. much. I mean, even going off the previous question, the idea of like perspective changing so many times, like how did you know where you were ending it, especially if you were writing this while you were going through it happening? I didn't really, you know, um, I and I did add a few things sort of that, that jump a little bit ahead, because um, it mostly takes place in this one, I mean, it's like the, 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 the the straightforward narrative takes place over the course of a year after, basically, but the backstory is peppered all the way through bits and pieces. It's not, it's not. I wouldn't call it chronological. It's just kind of as it made sense. We did move it around. We did move a lot of things around. I mean, it was kind of, you know, um, it was a little bit tricky, and we had some different sort of thoughts about that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I really was just kind of throwing a lot of stuff at the wall initially and then pairing it back as it made sense. There was one more thing I was going to say about that, but I don't know. <laughs> oh. 
at last. I think, I guess we're, I think we're at 8.30. I could, oh, it's just now 8, yeah. 8.30. Right? Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is such, such a great thing for the world and all of us that you've written this book and let us read it and put it out there. It's such a pleasure to talk about it with you. Oh, now. I'm thrilled. And uh, so everybody should immediately go <laughs> buy it and some of Betsy's other books and then you'll be signing. I'm, and I'm and sign any book for any person. Congratulations. <laughs>